Well, are y'all ready to get started tonight? Yeah. Amen. It's uh, it's 3.20 in the morning right now in San Francisco. So here in a little bit, I may need somebody to run and get me a, a five-hour energy drink or something. And, and we'll keep moving along here. Amen. God bless you. Let's read some scripture tonight. We're going we're gonna to read a few verses of scripture. And uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to... Go on a little journey here tonight. I feel confident in the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. I really do. The book of Ezra, chapter number four. And I want to go to the book of Haggai, the first chapter. And then Luke, chapter number 14. A few verses of scripture here tonight. Can we do it? Amen. Ezra, chapter four. And I want to begin reading at verse number four. And the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Everybody say building. Everybody say building. Turn to your neighbor and say building. Amen. Notice verse number five and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. You ever been frustrated in what you're trying to do for God? Have you ever been frustrated before? Amen. Haggai chapter number one. And I want you to, verse number seven, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the house. Everybody say, build the house. And I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Amen. Turn to somebody else on the other side and say, build the house. Luke chapter number 14 and verse number 28. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Now, I want you to, I want you to notice how this is termed because this is really important. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Everybody say finish it. Finish it. Let's go to verse number 29. This happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it. Everybody say finish it. it. All that behold it, it, begin to mock him. Verse 30, saying this man began to build and was not able to. Now notice he didn't say finish it. He didn't say finish it. He said he's just not able to finish I want to take that one word right there, the last word in that verse, finish. And that's my subject tonight. Finish. I'm preaching tonight to a finishing generation. I want to say that again because some of you don't believe it. I'm preaching to a finishing generation tonight. Amen. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's pray together. Would you fervently pray with me right now? Father, we love you. We thank you for the wonderful presence of your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the people of God that are here. We ask that you touch our minds and our spirits tonight, God, to receive the eternal word of God. Help us to be challenged, to open our spiritual understanding. We ask for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I, uh, I was uh, uh, pastoring in the state of Oklahoma, and God was good to us. We had a season of growth, and we had to do something about our building. The problem was, as I was pastoring in a very a uh, poor area, a lot of poverty in the area. And I don't know if I wanted to take on that kind of a payment because I knew who would have to pay for it if they didn't pay for it. And finally, God gave me a plan on how to remodel the building and expand it and accommodate our growth, and I thank God for it. But I'm going to tell you, I'm a preacher, not a builder. 
And we had some guys in the church there. Matter of fact, one of them we hired as our general contractor. And uh, I thought I was going to save us a bunch of money. But I'm going to tell you something. That little building project turned into quite a challenge. And uh, the problem is, is when they got started in the building, the, the contractor called me one day and he said, uh, Pastor Morgan, we got a problem. Little did I know I was going to hear that statement several more times. And I said, what's the problem? He said, a hurricane just went through Miami, Fort Lauderdale. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why would a hurricane there bother us in the Midwest somewhere? And I found out that all the sheet or the plywood and lumber was being shipped down there. And it tripled our lumber bill. So the next thing I knew, they called, the general contractor called, and he said, uh, Pastor, we got a problem. And I said, what's the problem? The building inspector just left here, and nothing in this church, the electrical's up to code. The bids that they, that they gave us <laughs> were with it up to code. And so your electrical bill just went up through the roof. And oh, by the way, your main power box, what we call power box, is less than five foot from the baptistry. And he shuts you all down until you move it. He wants to know why it's so close to the baptistry. And jokingly, I said, <laughs> they're going to get it one way or the other. How did you feel when you came out of the water? Amen. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to tell you, it turned, it was constantly something. Now, it, it helped that the banker that we were using, I'd prayed him through the Holy Ghost. Trust me, it helps. Amen. <laughs> and uh, it, it just turned into a deal. And I couldn't, I couldn't see all these hidden costs. Another thing about the building was is when they, when they built that old church years and years ago, they actually tore down another building and used the lumber from that building to build the church we were in. And so nothing in it was square, level, whatever you want to call it. And so we had to gut out stuff, and we went to the exterior walls. I almost could have built a new building for what I spent in that little remodel job. Now, I'm sure we got some people here that when you get ready to build, you go to the very penny on what it's going to cost you to build something. I mean, you know, this is what it's going to cost me, not a penny more, not a penny less. Now, if you have that gift, I'd like to meet you after church. <laughs> I really would. Because most people, when they build something, and I, I'm trying to encourage you here. I heard y'all were getting ready to remodel, so I'm trying to put a little faith in you right now. Amen. <laughs> Matter of fact, most people, when they build something, they, they, they don't and they cannot see what we would call hidden cost. I didn't know a hurricane was going to go through. I sure didn't know nothing was up to code. I didn't know that they tore down a building. I mean, that was just the beginning of it. There's a whole lot of other stuff. And so <clears throat> with that in mind, I'm having a hard time, or I was having a hard time, trying to figure out exactly what Jesus meant when he said, if you're going to build this tower, I want you to sit down and count the cost to see if you have sufficient to finish it. Because there is absolutely no way, and basically the subject at hand is the cost of discipleship. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to live for me, you might want to sit down and count the cost and see if you can pay it. I will tell you tonight that salvation is free, but Christianity is going to cost you everything. I want to say that again. Salvation is free, but Christianity will cost you everything. 
You've got to pick up your cross if you're going to follow him. The problem is, is the night or the day that you decided to live for God, you, uh, you thought you knew what it was going to cost you. But you didn't see five years down the road. You didn't see ten years down the road. You didn't see things that God hides from you. I believe he hides it from us because if you seen everything that you were going to have to go through and everything that you was going to have to pay at that initial moment, you would have staggered at the cost, the total cost of you living for God. Trust me, some of the trials you've been through, if God would have showed you all the trials and all the situations when you were headed down the aisle that night to the altar, you'd have said, man, I give up. There's no sense even getting started. I can't go through all that stuff. And so God hides some things. Am I making sense to anybody right now? God hides or allows it to be a hidden cost to us. So I don't know that Jesus was saying to us that you're going to have the ability to set down a count to the very penny or whatever your monetary value is, or system is, whatever it is, to the to the very, I mean, this down to the detail. What 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 do y'all got around here? Cents, dollars. Oh, you got a penny? No. Well, I'm gonna use penny. That's the least we got over there. Amen. That's why we call ourselves Pentecostals. <laughs> Now, I don't think that's, and the reason why I say that is because of the way it's worded. Finish it, finish it, but he doesn't say finish it at the end. He said he was not able to finish. Because I really believe that God knows enough about all this to know that there is not one human being alive that within themselves they are self-sufficient enough to finish this thing that we call faith or living for God on your own merit or by your own power. You you can't do it. I'm going to save you a lot of heartache. You can't do it. Even as great as the apostle Paul was, he come to a moment that he threw his hands up and said, I don't think I got enough to finish it. And I'm asking God to move this thorn in the flesh. And three times he prayed it. And finally, and this is where I want to take you, is finally in red letter edition, He says, Jesus says to Paul, the great apostle Paul, my grace. And the only thing that's sufficient enough for you to finish it is the grace of God to help you. Because if you don't have the grace of God helping you, you're in trouble because I hate to disappoint some of you. You ain't got enough. That went over real well. You ain't got enough. Now, you you may not have lived for God long enough, but if you do live for God long enough, you're going to come to a moment somewhere where you're going to face a situation and you're going to look at your checking account of faith and say, this is how much faith I got and this situation that I'm in, I just don't have enough to finish it. The fact is, is God's not asking you about finishing it. He wants to ask you the question, do you want to finish Because if it's in you to finish, that's all I need to know. Do you want to finish? Because if you want to finish, I got enough grace and enough things over here to make sure that you get the job done that I've called you to do. I wish somebody helped me preach here just a second. That I've called you to do. The only way that you've lived for God as long as you have is not because you're a super person. It's because of the grace of God and the goodness of God and the fact that you didn't have enough, but God said, here, I'll give you some of mine. I I, I don't want to stay here too long. You know, I, I, I view faith like a checking account. And I'm telling you, I've had some situations in my life that I looked at what it was being charged and I looked at what I had and I'm just going to tell you right now, I didn't have enough. Oh my God, what kind of preacher you got over here? I didn't have enough. I've met some situations in living for God and my faith, I didn't have enough and I knew I didn't have enough. 
Let me tell you what the word grace is in the Greek. It's charism, C-H-A-R-I-S-M. It's where you get charismatic or charismata. It actually means gift. It's just the gift of God, which I believe the greatest gift of God and the truest grace of God is the Holy Ghost. It's a gift. And so God looked at you and said, you, you, you can't live for me by yourself. You need a little help here. So I'm going to empower you with something called the Holy Ghost. Stay with me here just a second. I'm going to empower you with something called the Holy Ghost. Now, it's not just that, but if you ever read over the gifts of the Spirit, the Bible calls one of them the gift of faith. So God looks at the little measure of faith you have. He says, hey, you need a little bit more than that chicken account of yours, don't you? Yeah, I do. You ain't got enough, do you? You don't have enough faith, do you? No, I don't. Do you want to finish? Yes, I want to finish. Well, good. I'm going to give you some of mine. <laughs> One night in prayer, the Lord spoke to me and said uh, uh, two things he shared with me. And then his second one, he said, and tomorrow night, I'm going to heal everything in the building. And I was like, whoa, everything, everything in the building. And so that Sunday morning, I got up and announced, man, we had church that Sunday morning. I mean, man, they were running and shouting and, and, and tearing chunks out of the wall. And I mean, it was wild Pentecostal church. I mean, wild church. And, and I got up at the end of the service and said, tonight we're having a healing service and God's going to heal everything in the building. Now, I don't know where the church went to that was there Sunday morning, but the bunch that come back was not there Sunday morning. Because, I mean, it was deader than a... I'm, listen to me. You see how quiet it is in here right now? This is extremely lively compared to that service. Because all we have to do is start talking about miracles and people in Pentecost are ready to see the show. And so I announced the service. We got back that night, and I mean nothing. And what God was trying to teach me is I want you to disattach your emotions from your faith. So I said, okay. I said, Everybody that wants to be healed, I need you to get in line tonight. And they got in the line. I mean, they, they lined up. And the first lady that was in line had Parkinson's disease. And her hand was, and her arm was drawn up, and it was shaking real bad. And I'm standing there on the platform. The service is dead. There's not an ounce of anything going on. And I look at her, and in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God. Why didn't we start with a couple backaches or... A headache or two or something, you know? Now, in the States, we'd say, you don't start throwing 98-mile-an-hour fastballs right out. Let the guy warm up with a few pitches here a little bit, God. But, Brother Woodward, I mean, it, I mean, it was just, there she was, first one in line. And I'm going to tell you, don't you listen to me. At that moment, my faith was... And I done stepped out. God said he's going to heal everything in the building tonight. And so I just got the bottle of oil and I stepped off the platform. When I stepped off the platform, it felt like a, a garment or something draped across my shoulders. And I heard the Lord say, the gift of faith now rests upon you. Now, in the moment that that happened, trust me, I could have believed God for anything. I didn't even get to pray for the lady. I just started to cross the front. And when I did, she starts doing this little deal. Woo, woo, woo. Whoa. And then she just starts spinning like a top, and when she got through, she stopped. She stopped, stopped. That hand that was drawn and withered, it just fell down to her side. The Parkinson's was completely gone out of her body. And I'm, I'm, still, I'm still standing about right from here to there, and that's already happened. And then the lady behind her, she's got severe back problems, and I haven't even got to touch anybody yet. And she starts screaming, I'm healed, and I mean, Trust me, she'd been back surgeries and everything. And, I mean, she was going frontwards and backwards and sideways. And, and I mean, and she's screaming, I'm healed. And then it jumped from her to the person behind her. And I'm just kind of standing there watching. God said, I, I just want to know, did you want to finish? You, you ain't got enough to heal anybody. 
But if you want to finish, that's all I needed to know. I'll give you the gift of faith. Woo. See, that takes a lot of your excuses away. Well, I'd live for God, but I just don't. Oh, boy. Mm. Are we good here tonight? Y'all y'all ready for me to crank it up, aren't you? Huh. We may be in trouble tonight. <laughs> you know, God's not interested in all your sufficiency. He just wants to know you want to finish. That's all I need to know. Do you want to finish? Now, there's something about starting something and not finishing it that brings great shame. Mm -hmm. He said, now, if you're going to build this tower, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to just start out building it and not count the cost and be determined that you're going to finish this thing. Lest after you've laid the foundation, or trust me, I know where I'm headed. After you've laid the foundation, men come by and they say, this man began to build, but he's not able to finish. And they begin to mock him. Now, with Jesus giving you that little illustration, I want to take you back in history just a little bit, okay? I want to tell you a Bible story. There's a man in the presence of the king. The king was Cyrus, I think Nehemiah and all the, you know the story. And finally he said, why are you so sad? Well, why could I be excited? The house of God and my city lies in waste. And Cyrus, now stay with me here. Cyrus, he, he gives a royal decree, a royal decree. I'm going to send you guys back, and I want you to go ahead and rebuild that city and rebuild your temple. And oh, by the way, I'm going to finance it. A heathen king. And so Nehemiah and them come back, and they start building. It's, it, if I start boring you, let me know, okay? I don't want to bore you. And, and, and he, so they get back, and they start building. You would think that everybody around there would be excited about what was going on, but they weren't. There were some people there, which was the origin of what we call the Samaritans. Because when they took the people of God into captivity, they left a lot of Hebrew women in the land of promise, but they left Babylonian men there, and they married, producing what we call the Samaritans. That's why the Jews hated them so much, is because they reminded them of a time of great humiliation. And so there's some of these guys that were still there. We call them Sam Ballard and Tobiah and all that crew. And so when the people of God come back and started building, now watch this. I'm going to preach now. In, in 52 or 58 days, they rebuilt the walls. Commentaries tell you that it was impossible, humanly impossible for them to do it in that amount of time. One commentary says it was almost like there was great cranes. That's the way the, the, the writer pens it that was helping them. And that was so intrigued because it was supernatural events helping them put together. And they got these walls built in 52 days. And not only did they get the walls done, but here's Sam Ballard and Tobiah trying to strike fear in their heart. Listen, you people better stop, man. We're going to come here and kill every one of you. And Nehemiah says, you go tell those guys out there, we're doing a good work and we're not coming down. We're going to finish this wall. And in 52 days, they finished the wall. Now why, now just stay with me here a second. Why is the wall important? The wall to them was not the thing of value. The wall was to protect what was really valuable to them. They knew they had to rebuild the wall. And so then they get in here and they start all the stuff and on there. They got the wall going up. And this deal with Sandbell and Tobiah, and I mean, man, it's quite a little battle going back and forth. And in such a, you know, in a short span, they got the wall rebuilt. Now, the problem is, is they went to lay the foundation of the temple. And while all this is going on, they're all excited, man. We're gonna we're gonna rebuild this temple. And they got the foundation of being laid. Now, you got a transfer of a king over here somewhere, and it goes from Cyrus to Artaxerxes, and, and he's king now. And what happens in the chapter that I read to you, those guys, those Samaritan people, they, the Bible says that they hired counselors against them. They might frustrate the purpose. Actually, what they did is, is they bribed high-ranking court officials in Artaxerxes' court to stop the finances. 
And so there's been a flow of finances for them to do this stuff. All of a sudden, the finances turned off. That's why it talks about they did weaken the hands of God's people in the building. And so you know what the people of God did? They got frustrated. And so instead of going and just keeping building, they just said, you know what? Let's forget all this. We're just going to go build our own houses. Forget this temple stuff. Now, they've got a foundation laid. They laid it within two years. So 52 weeks or 52 days, 58 days, whatever it is, to build the wall. And within two years, they got a foundation laid. Hmm. Which proves to me it's probably easier for us to build walls and lay foundations than to finish. I'm not going to get on that right now. Now, pretty sad story, isn't it? 14 years later, Haggai the prophet begins to prophesy to the people of God. He says, and while you've lived in your sealed houses, because the finances got cut off, there's no resources, you didn't think you had enough to finish it. And so instead of you pressing on, you just got frustrated and discouraged. And so you just got involved in your own houses, doing your own thing, and you forgot the house of God. And 14 years later, Haggai begins to prophesy against them. He said, listen, I'm going to tell you something. This is what the Lord wants me to tell you. He said, the reason why you plant but you don't sow very much is because you got more concerned about your house than you did the house of God. And he said, that's why you're having trouble. That's why it doesn't rain like it ought to rain. That's why when you do get a crop, it's, 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 it's horrible. It's already rotted, and all this stuff is happening. He said, this is what God did to you because God intended for you to finish what you started. Mm. I believe the Lord's given me a word for you tonight. And so they, they said, well, you know, Haggai, we got trouble. And he says, listen, you quit saying that it's not time. You keep saying it's not time. Boy, isn't that a great message? Well, then one of these days we're going to have revival. One of these days this is going to happen. One of these days, one of these days, one of these days, one of these days. We're going to start doing this. One of these days we're going to have a harvest. One of these days we're going to build. One of these days we're going to... And they just pushed it, kept pushing it off because everybody just got involved. Boy, don't that sound like our day right now? They just all got involved, taking care of themselves, building their own house, taking care of their families. I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot. This is just an American problem. And I mean, here they were. And Haggai said, now listen, you say you don't have the money to do it. He said, but the Lord says, quit waiting on them to give you the money. You go cut some timber and bring it down and you show God that you're serious about finishing this thing and you start building on this again. And you see what will happen. He said, matter of fact, let me tell you what the Lord said. He said, if you do this, he said, he'd shake the heavens and the earth. He'd shake the nations. He'd bring people out of the nations. And oh, by the way, he wants me to remind you that all the gold and the silvers is. And so guess what happens? They said, let's do it. So they went up to the mountains. They cut some timber. They brought it back down there. They started building. And the Samaritans sent a letter back to Babylon. Now this time, it's, it's, it's Darius that's king, the grandson of Cyrus. And so they send this letter to him and said, we got a problem. You got these pesky little Jews over here. And if you let them build this temple of theirs, they're going to cause a, an insurrection. They're going to cause you a bunch of trouble. You need to stop this right now. And so, so Darius sends a letter down to the people of God that says, you need to stop now. Stop this right now. And they sent a letter back and said, why do we need to stop? We're only doing what your grandpa said we could do by royal decree. And Darius said, where is this decree? So people said, well, we don't know where it's at. He said, find it. And so they went to searching, and somewhere up in a summer palace, way up in the mountains somewhere, they found this decree hid in a wall. And they brought it to him, and he says, why hasn't this been honored? This is a royal decree. 
He said, bring me a scribe. So they brought him a scribe. He said, I'm going to give a royal decree myself. And he said, this is my decree. Whoever I find not honoring what my grandpa said, I'm going to tear his house down. I'm going to hang him on the timbers of it. And I'm going to make it a dung heap. Now, I don't know where the problem's coming from all this resistance that's frustrating you people from doing what you're supposed to be doing, but I'm going to put a stop to it. And he said, and the only thing that I'm asking from the Jews is to this one God they serve, just pray for the king and his sons that that God will take care of them. And all of a sudden, where the spigot was turned off, it was turned back on where there was a lack of finances, where there was a lack of resources, where there was a lack of the things that was needed to finish it, all of a sudden now, because the people proved to God, we're going to finish. We're going to finish. We are going to finish. And when they proved to God that they were going to finish, God said, that's all I was waiting on. I'm not going to give resources to people that don't have it in them to finish. i tell you who I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless those who've got their minds made up and have got to determine so I'm going to finish. That's why I told you a while ago, don't blame God. Don't blame you your lack of faith. Don't, don't blame you backsliding. Well, I just can't live for God. Why can't you? If God gives you everything you need, I have people tell me all the time, I, I, I just can't do it. You're exactly right. You can't do it. You can't do it on your own. You, you got that one figured out. But if you'll just show God that you want to live for him, he'll help you overcome all those things that you don't think that you can overcome and correctly so on your own flesh you can overcome it but if you'll just show God hey I'd really like to live for you and be victorious that's all God's looking for boy I got a little headwind here tonight well you know now now listen we got a great foundation. We got a tremendous foundation. Careful there, Pedro. You're going to hurt somebody up there. <laughs> we, we, got, we got a, he's excited. I can tell you that right now. We got a great foundation. Tremendous foundation. But let me ask you a question. What kind of idiot would you think I would be if I was building something, Brother Woodward, and years later, all I got is a foundation? And I say, hey, come over here and see my foundation. (laughs) Well, that in that same foundation that was here last year, yeah, isn't that a great foundation? (laughs) I got y'all so set up you don't even see it coming. (laughs) Man, this this look at this foundation. This is a great foundation. I mean, look, man, we've been we've been working hard on this foundation. Look at this, I mean, now this this is a good foundation. And it is a good foundation. I was asked to preach a revival. Now, um, I, I, the, the names won't mean anything to you, but hopefully it makes sense. I was asked to preach this revival in a church, and the problem was is everybody there had had the Holy Ghost for three or 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> and in the States, in the... Uh, late 60s and early 70s, there was a guy that was tremendously used of God in the States by the name of Verbal Bean. He was an old prophet kind of, I mean, mightily used of God and all. And a lot of those people in that church had prayed through in Verbal Bean's revival back in the late 60s and early 70s. And I'd preach for a couple Sundays through the week and they'd all come up after church and say, Man, I prayed through during the verbal bean revival. And now don't you listen to me. There's nobody has any greater respect for verbal bean than I do. I've even pastored some of his family. But after a while, we were going to have this long extended revival. So that Sunday, I got up and I said, I want to inform this church that this is my last service. And I turned to the pastor and he was a little shocked. And they were really, because I mean, we we're going to have this long revival. 
And I took the text about the foundation and I preached that day about foundations. And I said, the problem with this church is you got a great foundation, but that's as far as you got. You're still shouting about the foundation. There's no sidewalls. <laughs> There's no trusses. Oh, well, come over and look at our foundation. I mean, after a while, thank God for the foundation. You don't, you, don't, you don't even have a building if you don't have a foundation. You've got to have the right foundation. i got news for you. The church has got a great foundation. The apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. we got a tremendous foundation. And if you're building on something besides what they taught and preached, I hate to tell you, you're on the wrong foundation. But I just, I said, this is it. I, I, I can't preach in a place that all you want to do is every service come up here and shout about the foundation. Oh, come over and look at our foundation. My God, man, we got a great foundation. Whoa, whoa, we got a great foundation. Look at this foundation. But you know what? I find that it's, it's like that in a lot of our Pentecostal churches. Now, we got the walls up, and we got a great foundation. But the problem is, what about the temple? And now we, we, we're a finishing generation. Just as strategically as God called Peter, James, and John, and Paul to lay that foundation and to start this building project, he said, I'm, I'm looking for some folks in the end time that understand the significant role of finishing this thing. Mm. I just need somebody that's got it in their mind. We're going to finish. That, that, that's all I'm looking for right now. Now, 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 just stay with me here a second. Now, I don't know what your economy's like, but the whole global economy is not in the best situation. And if you're waiting on some government to fix it or whatever, I don't think... And we're frustrated. We're frustrated. I can promise you that the number one problem that we face in trying to reach the world and evangelize the world and have a harvest is resources, finances. And we're just like the Jews. Well, if we could just start getting the money, we could do something. But since we don't have enough money and we get overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task, let's just forget all this and just work on ourselves and just get a good income and get a nice house and take care of the family. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. And then we wonder why we're not being blessed and we wonder why our churches are frustrated and why the work of God is frustrated. I got news for you. If you think the devil wants to release the resources into the end time church just because he doesn't have anything else to do. Here, here's the money. Here's the resources. Y'all go have revival. It ain't going to happen that way. There is spiritual resistance to what I'm talking about tonight. Are you listening to me? And the fact is, I'm going to tell you the churches that are going to be blessed, and I'm going to tell you the people in the end time that God's going to use. It's the people who quit making excuses, listen to me, on why we're not having revival and why we're not finishing this and why we're not building the temple. And God's just looking for people that will say, you know what, I'm going to go cut some timber. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to quit waiting on some big miracle to happen before I go do something for God. I'm going to prove to God that I'm, I'm going to prove to God that I'm serious about this deal. Let me help some of you something here just a second. Let me help you something. I'm getting mad. I really am. I'm getting mad right now because it's everywhere. Pentecostal people are funny people. Because, well, you know, if we get dressed up and we talk in tongues enough, everything's fine. Really. 
What about all those parables that Jesus gave about talents and stewards and responsibility and people hiding their talents in the earth and saying, I knew that thou were an austere man. and Because he's trying to show you the principle. He's trying to show you what he's like. And see, we fail to understand that this life is nothing more but a little test to see what you're really worthy of for the next life to come. Amen. And there's two areas in this life that God's going to test you with. Are you ready for it? Amen. Before he ever trusts you with true riches, he's going to test you with temporary stuff. The true riches of God is eternity and his glory. And so before he gives you eternity, he's going to test you with your time. I want to see how you handle your time. I want to see what you do with your time. Now, see, we don't even think about this kind of stuff. Well, I go to church on Sunday. I'm talking about finishing the church age here tonight. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who finally start saying, you know what? We might want to start taking responsibility for this thing and quit waiting on some elite group to do it all. This is our responsibility to get this job done. The second thing he's going to test you with is finances. Before I give you the true riches, which is my glory, I'm going to test you with gold. Because if you don't handle the gold right, you're telling me you won't handle the glory right. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm back in the States as, as tight as it's getting right now. I really do. Well, I just, you know, it's just, I'm just going to pay my. Has, has, does it ever dawn on any of us? How are you going to reach Australia? How, how are you going to reach nations? How, how are you going to have this revival? Did, did, does, does nobody think that somewhere in the, the equation of all of this, somebody has got to be blessed? And they got to know what the blessing's for. The blessing is for us to finish. And God's just looking throughout the earth right now for people who've got it in their spirit. You know what? I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go back down there. I'm going to cut some timber. I've seen churches that were locked up and couldn't have revival and made all kinds of excuses. I've seen them just show God a little effort, and they are amazed when they show God a little effort, what God begins to do because he says, listen, I'm getting excited about this. You're coming back to this temple business stuff. You're actually starting to build the church like it ought to be built, and you're getting back involved in what you ought to be back involved in. And you know what? He said, I'll shake the heavens. I'll do whatever I got to do to make sure that you get the resources. My God, have mercy. Mm, boy, maybe I should have preached another sermon tonight. Amen. This is where we're at. God's just waiting on you. Well, we're just waiting on the right time. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting on five millionaires to walk in my church and start tithing and start blessing the kingdom of God. And when that happens, I'm going to start supporting missions, Pastor, and I'm even going to start paying my tithe. No, you're not. You're not going to do any more then than you do right now. Mm. I travel all the world. I got people always coming up. God says he's going to make me a millionaire. I just get, when they tell me, I say, oh, boy, here we go again. Okay, God told you he's going to make you a millionaire. Have you took any classes on how to handle your finances? How bad in debt are you? Maybe this is just an American problem, and I just need to go back to the States and preach to those crazy folks over there. And people sitting there in church services all the time crying, mission service. Oh, pastor, I, I, I just wish I had something to give. I promise you. If, if, if I make a million dollars, I'm going to support missions. And... Why, why are you lying on the Holy Ghost for? Let me ask you a question. 
if you can't handle $500 this week, what makes you think you can handle a million dollars next week? And if you're not showing God a little effort right now, listen, y'all can get quiet. I've preached in quiet places before. Trust me. In America, we have chainsaws, and I'm about to break one loose and just start cutting everything up I can cut up. We're going to cut some timber down here tonight and show God, hey, we're not just here having a conference. We're here because we want the Holy Ghost to talk to us, and our world needs an impact, and we need... I'm going to set the plow down here. I mean, I, I cannot tell you how many churches I've been, how many places I've seen this. I mean, they're just faith, just like, well, you know, they're just, it's, I hate to say it, it's just kind of locked up. And we're afraid to say anything about it. Well, let's not talk about money. Why not? Jesus talked more about money than any other subject. Boy, look what I found. <laughs> he said, let me tell you about the two masters of the world. It's not God and the devil. Quit with the devil. Oh, the devil. He said, oh, no, no, no. God and mammon. And it's the love of money. You can be broke and still love it. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. There's only two masters in the world. It's God and unrighteous mammon or money. Amen. That's the two masters of the world. Now, y'all stay with me. We're going to have good church here tonight, believe it or not. We're going to get through this little hurricane we're going through right now. We're going to have good church here in a second. You know, it's, 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 this is just where we're at. And when we start talking about money, it don't matter where it's at. It just... Get off my pew, preacher. Get off, get off. We got people so tight in our churches, they talk through their nose to save wear and tear on their false teeth. I'm here to preach about revival, folks. What, what, what's wrong with us? Do we not believe God? I, th I think that's a little of our battle right there, that we honestly don't believe. The, now, oh, we believe Acts 2.38. But what about all those other verses? What about, in my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in, no, 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 not, not in your economy, glory. What about those verses? Well, it's the Old Testament. People's always come around. I had a guy show up here a while back. He says, tithing one out with the law. Oh, don't, please give me a break. And he made the horrible mistake of, of, of trying to quote a scripture well, I don't know why I'm on this, but here we are. And, 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 and I said, listen, listen. In Hebrews 7, I said, let me help you, sir. The Hebrew people would not take their tithing and pay it into the Christian community. They still were taking their tithe down to the temple and paying it to the priest. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to prove something. When he says that Melchizedek was that beginning of days, now I know I'm fixing to open up a can of worms and who likes worms, amen. But the fact is, when he says he's without beginning of days, that simply means at 30 years of age, the boy or the man could enter into the high priest. Beginning of days is the term they used to start his priesthood. The end of life was 55. He could only serve from 30 to 55. The term is beginning of days, 30, end of life, 55. 55 because his eyesight's starting to fail him. And he cannot inspect the sacrifice like it needs to be inspected. And so God had a plan. And so they're trying to help the Christians to know it's okay for you to pay your tithe to something that's not a Levitical priesthood. 
your great, your grandfather, Abraham, I mean, this is one that you say we're the sons of, he was paying tithe and his, and the loans of him was paying tithe to Melchizedek and Melchizedek's not even a Levitical priesthood. So we were paying tithe to a priesthood that was not Levitical before there was a Levitical priesthood. So it's okay for you to pay your tithe to something that's out past the Levitical priesthood. And that's what he's trying to tell you in, in, in Hebrews chapter seven. But, we, you know, we're so busy building our houses and building up our accounts and doing all this stuff and all that we don't even think sometimes how is the church really going to survive and what are we going to do to have the revival? Watch this. Now, we can get them to start preaching about what we're going to do. And we all, oh, that sounds good. But what about when it comes down to us proving to God by cutting some timber and showing God? We serious about this. Can I just kind of stretch our faith here just a little bit? I've had God ask me to do some stuff, Brother Woodward, and I'm like, ooh, whoa. I, I, I didn't want to get in the crusade business. It just kind of happened. And so we launched the first crusade, major city crusade in San Francisco. Now, remember, I'm an evangelist for the United Pentecostal Church, which means I'm broke. <laughs> Well, that's just slid that one in right there. Amen. <laughs> the first one was over a quarter of a million dollars. And I was like, oh, Jesus. And, and I could take it to the spot. The Lord said, are you going to do this? I said, mm-hmm. Yep. I cannot tell you when I showed God how serious I was, the miracles that started happening. I mean, miracle after miracle. I, I mean, in services, is this okay? Is this all right? I mean, I, I mean, I was in one place. I mean, we, I was like, oh Jesus, man! And before the service was over, I had I, it's, about, it's almost ninety thousand dollars. Just there. I said another service, and and I sat on the platform. I said, God. We, we got to have $10,000 by tomorrow. We're, we're broke. We got to keep this thing moving. And now the service was over, and I was just still, I mean, everybody was leaving the building, and I was just sitting up there on the platform. I just felt, and I said, Lord, you know what the need is, and I believe you're going to supply it. Whether you do it here tonight or in the morning, you send a drunk to my motel. I don't care. <laughs> the devil's had it long enough. We'll take it. <laughs> now, I'm preaching something tonight that needs to be preached. Yeah. So I sat in there and I seen this guy come walk across the platform. He walked over to him and said, you're not going to believe what the Lord asked me to do. I said, I know what the Lord's going to ask you to do. He told you to give me $10,000. He said, how'd you know? <laughs> oh, he can talk to you, but he can't talk to me. <laughs> he said, well, we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, I don't have it. I said, that is a problem. <laughs> he said, what time do you fly out tomorrow? I said, I don't know, 11 something, 12 o'clock. He said, I'll see you before you leave. The next morning, a little after nine, he shows up where I stand, knocked on the door. He said, here you go. Here's a cashier's check from the bank for $10,000. I said, thank you. You pastor? No, yeah. All right, thank you. We just kept moving right along. Woo. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. I prophesied over man in the probably the late 80s or early 90s. It was no later than 91 or 2, I know. And I called him out that night. I, I don't claim to be a prophet or anything, but I do know what it's like for a prophetic anointing to come on me. So I called him out that night. I told him what God was going to do in his life, and it was pretty far out there. I mean, way out there. Financially, it was out there. And he just kept kind of shaking his head when I was telling him. And I said, do you believe me? He said, I'm trying. I said, well, it's going to happen. So after church, he come up and said, I, I appreciate what you said, and I'm going to hold on to it. And I said, all right. And we began to develop a friendship. And every once in a while, he'd call, hey, man, pray for me. He was a businessman. What he didn't tell me is the night that I called him out, he was in bankruptcy. And they had picked his equipment up out of his yard that day. 
And then I'm prophesying all this big stuff's going to happen. Millions of dollars are going to come and, and all this stuff and on. He was, and so he went to, uh, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. He went to sign some contracts with his pastor. They had the ink pen in their hand. They showed him where to sign. And as he reached over, got the pen and it was started to sign it, the telephone rang and the, the guy's doing business with talk. He said, hold it just a second. We're going to have to hold off on this contract. That's how close that man was to signing a multi-million dollar contract. So his pastor and him called me after and told me, so we had a little prayer meeting and that prayer meeting, the Lord began to show me some things in the spirit about that was resisting the finances of God's people. Won't go into it. But he showed me three spirits in the end time that were going to resist the finances of God's people. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. What you don't understand is money is very spiritual. And when you get into this arena, there is a tremendous spiritual struggle. Hmm. Resistance. So, uh, Salt Lake City General Conference. The Lord spoke through Brother Willoughby to my wife and I about San Francisco. I've been traveling, and my wife's been over there teaching Bible studies. I'm traveling all over the world, having fun. She's teaching Bible studies. And, and the Lord spoke to me at that conference about San Francisco. So I told my wife, I said, we're going to lock in. I said, starting in December, I don't know why I said December. I was crazy. But starting in December, I'm going to do at least every other Sunday in San Francisco. Now, you got to understand, San Francisco is the second most expensive place to live in America. Manhattan, New York's number one. San Francisco's number two. Now, I'm going into San Francisco, which is very expensive, and plus, I just cut my salary in half. I said, are you sure about this? I said, I'm positive. Well, when we got involved in it, I, I got to doing more than just every other Sunday. It's two or three Sundays I stand. And God began. But what happened was is, it, it was getting a little crazy, but all God was asking me for was timber. Are you going to build this church or are you going to do this? And I said, yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you, folks, it got pretty tight. You ever been there? Anybody in the building ever been in tight before? God's getting ready to give you all some miracles. He's going to give you a miracle for this conference. So one day I was praying. I said, Lord, it's, it's getting pretty tight here. And my phone rang, and there was this man. I hadn't talked to him in months. He said, remember that night you prophesied over me, and I told you that if God did this, you wouldn't have to worry about what you was going to do for God. I said, mm-hmm. Remember those contracts I lost? I said, mm-hmm. He said, I signed them yesterday. I said, you signed them? He said, yes, sir. I said, and how much did you sign? He said, more than you and I can spend. He said, how much money do you need in that home missions church right now? I said, what are you talking about? He said, I mean, on a monthly deal, how much money do you need for you to survive and that church to survive? And I said, I, I don't know. He said, no, tell me. I want to know. I said, I don't know, seven, eight thousand dollars a month at minimum. He said, okay, starting this month, he said, every month for the next year at least, he said, I'll send you the first month ten thousand dollars. No questions asked. We just send it to you. Now I know here in Australia, ten thousand dollars pocket change for everybody here. <laughs> but trust me, it wasn't there. And uh then uh that started happening and then I had this old car, and it it's, it was falling apart and all the stuff went on, and I, I went in to trade it, and they just laughed. Yeah, right. So I said, man, we're so upside down. Never said anything to the guy. Just never said anything to him. A few months later, he called me back. He said, hey, listen, I want to buy you a car. What kind of car you want? I said, I don't know. I said, you see, yeah, I'll buy you a car. Whatever kind of car you want, I'll buy it. I said, a Mercedes, whatever you want, I'll buy it. Rolls Royce, <laughs> whatever you want, I'll buy it. You serious? Mm. I said, okay. I said, I want a little Honda Element. He said, what in the world is that? I said, it's a real cheap little car. It costs about twenty-something thousand dollars. He said, 
that's it? I said, that's it. I said, that's all we want. He said, I ain't going to buy that. That's crazy. He said, I'm, I'm just wasting money. A little cracker box something. He said, no. And two days later, the, the postal service delivered an envelope, and I opened it up, and a check fell out, and there's a note in there for $25,000. said, enjoy your matchbox. <laughs> I can't tell you the times that the miracles happened. I can't tell you the times that God said, I want to know if you're serious about revival. I don't need people who, and don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I don't need people who's always just going to play it safe. I'm going to tell you something about revival. There's some risk that's involved. There's an element of faith that God expects you to operate in. It's not always going to make sense when God tells you to do something. Just go cut some timber. What good's that going to do? You know how much timber we need? Besides that, after the timber, we're supposed to overlay everything with gold. I just want you to do your part. Just go cut some timber, and you watch what I can do. And thank God that story doesn't end in such a disastrous situation. In a few months' time, the Bible says, and the temple was finished. And I'm telling you, in the end time, God is looking throughout the earth right now for people that say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm just going to cut God some timber. I don't understand all the dynamics of it. I'm closing this thing. I don't understand the dynamics of all this, but I do understand the simple act of faith. And I'm going to show God that I'm serious about this revival. And I'm going to show God that I'm serious about taking the world. And I'm going to show God that I'm serious about building a church. How about you? And all that God's asking from some of you is, you know where your miracles are going to start happening? Go cut some timber. Just go cut some timber and bring it to the house of God and show God that you're serious about it. You talk about resources. Do you think that God's going to put us in the end time and all the stuff that we need and then keep back the gifts and the things of God away from the church? The book of Acts had one statement, and great grace was upon them all. And if God gave them great grace or great giftings, why in the name of God do you think that the generation that's supposed to finish this thing, that God is going to withhold from us the gifts of the Spirit, the resources of the Spirit, and all the, I got news for you. That's not the intent of God. The intent of God for the end time is I'll pour it out on you if I could just find somebody that will believe that I... Just, I, I understand you want to play it safe. You don't want no embarrassment. You, you don't want to face failure. You're, well, you know, I, I knew somebody one time got all excited about giving and they gave and they lost everything they own and they lost their house and they lost all the stuff and on. So, well, for everyone that you can tell about that, I can tell you about 500 to the opposite. I got something cornered here right now. This is where it's going to break. When's the last time you locked yourself in prayer and cut some timber and started a fire of prayer to prove to God, I'm really serious about this revival. God wants to set this nation on fire with the Holy Ghost revival. And he wants to start it here. And all he's asking from you is timber. Just go cut me some timber. Just show me that you're interested. Just show me that you're concerned. Jesus, help us here tonight. Just, just do something to show me that it's just not idle words or something. I, I want to, I'm going to tell you something. If some of you will catch what I'm talking about right now, I promise you, I promise you. Well, I don't. God will. He will open the windows of heaven. I'm not talking about just finances. He will open the windows of heaven. Amen. Open the windows of heaven. You can't even build a big enough room for the blessing of God to come into. Oh, boy.
Well, I'm, I'm in a mess up here. <laughs> There's so much stuff coming to me right now, and I'm just trying to, one night after preaching about giving and God blessing you financially, I had a guy come up after service, and he was, he was really irritated. He said, you're preaching false doctrine. I said, in, in what, what part was I preaching false doctrine? Well, you said if we give money, God gave us money back. And I said, yeah, that's what I said. He said, that's false doctrine. And I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, how's that false doctrine? Well, I just don't believe it. Oh, so because you don't believe it, that makes it false doctrine. He said, um, well, I can give money, but that don't mean God's going to give me money back. He can keep my wife from having cancer. He can ki-. I said, well, I didn't say that God couldn't do those things. I said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, all right. I said, what do you think the apostle Paul meant when he said, and whatsoever a man soweth that. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. It's the universal law of harvest. Now listen, I don't know how it works here. I think I do. You have watermelons here? They understand watermelons? Okay, tomatoes? You'll say tomatoes or tomatoes or y'all gonna learn how to say it. We'll just just hang on. Now listen, you don't plant watermelons and it come up tomato. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much you plant it and stand there and say, I speak in the name of Jesus. I s-. It's not going to happen. Because whatever you put in that soil, it's going to come up. Folks, it's not that hard to figure out. And if we start planting our resources and our finances in the things of God, trust me, you know what God says? Oh, no, you don't. I, boy, I'm going to pour. Why do I say that? It's like, oh. I'm used to people, especially at church, I don't take debt offerings. I, I said, we don't, there'll never be a debt offering tuck in this church. You're going to clap and be happy and rejoice and shout when you bring your offering. I've preached enough in Pentecostal churches. When we got ready to take an offering, the whole disattached thing happens. Everybody gets disattached. Oh, we're all attached to the service till it's offering time. But the moment we say offering, it's like the great disattachment. <laughs> as soon as the offering plate passes, it's, it's a miracle what happens. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Offering place done pass by. I feel good now, man. Let's sing some more. Let's sing now. I mean, I, listen, folks. I, I, I just been at this too long because it's it's just everywhere. It's just this is the whole deal. I said we're not taking a dead offering around here. I don't care if you got a penny or whatever y'all get. I don't care what you got. You're gonna be happy about giving it. You are going to get excited about planting seed. God have mercy. I, I, got, I got to stop this thing, man. I feel like you, you're, you're the one that sets the perimeters. Paul said, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Now, if you want a big crop, he said, just sow bountifully. And besides that, if you put one little seed in the ground, this is the nature of all of it. He don't just come up one little seed. It's a bunch of it that comes up. And God said, this is how I operate. And this is what I'm trying to do. Now, I don't care what's going on outside the four walls of this church. I don't care what the global economy does. The blessing of God is not determined by what's going on outside these four walls. And God is going to raise up in this end time churches that have the blessing of God upon them. Boy, I'm telling you, some of you are looking at me like, oh, he's just after an offering. I don't need your money, and the church don't need your money. Keep your 39 cents. You think you're going to bankrupt God by holding that change in your pocket? You ain't getting my money. 
I got news for you. God wants it. He can get it. Now in America, we got something called the IRS. God could put you flat on your back and take everything away from you in a second's time. You might want to get your attitude, sir, straight about money. You might want to start believing God when it comes to all this kind of stuff. You might want to have a little faith when it comes to all this kind of stuff. If I was preaching about a healing and having an act of faith, some of you'd already be up here wanting to be healed with the same God that heals is the same God that supplies. I'm going to preach till something breaks in this place right now. Pick, pick me out somebody I need to borrow on here just a second. Just real quick. I, listen, trust me. I'm the one that's tired. Y'all should be good right now. Come up here. I want, I want to borrow you for a second, okay? You good? All right. Pay your tithe? Okay, I'm just checking. I don't want to be standing next to somebody when lightning hits them. I had a guy walk up one night after church. He said, the Lord wants you to pray over my checkbook and pray the blessing of God on me. So he has a checkbook in his hand. He handed it out, and I reached out for it, and the Holy Ghost said, do not touch it. He's cursed. I just <laughs> started backing away. And he, uh, listen, I'm telling you, this is a, he's standing there holding his checkbook out, got his eyes closed, ready for the prophet to pronounce the blessing on him. I felt like Balaam. I can't bless what God's cursed. <laughs> Finally, he perceived something was not happening. He opened his eyes and said, something wrong? I said, yeah, you're cursed. <laughs> he said, what you mean? I said, you pay your tithe? He said, well, sort of. And I said, well, what's sort of? 8.8%? 7.3? 6.7? 1.0. What's sort of? I'm having fun now. Some of you are squirming. I'm having fun making you squirm. Now listen, listen, listen. Been baptized in Jesus' name? Do you know that baptism is the covenant? Do you know that? In the Old Testament, the covenant was circumcision that made you the seed of Abraham. In the New Testament, it's baptism. Did you know that when that preacher baptized, where did you baptize that? On a chapel in New Zealand. Okay. When you were baptized in Jesus' name and you come up and you were born again with the Lord and the Spirit, you, sir, you became a part of the seed of Abraham. Amen. That meant everything that's in the stump and the root system of the Old Testament, you got it. Do you know that? And all of the blessings of God that he pronounced upon Abraham... You got them. Amen. You got them. Now, why in the world would you walk around like you're worried about everything and that God's not going to take care of you? Amen. Abraham, wherever you put your feet, I'm going to give it to you. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Abraham, I'm going to multiply. Abraham, I'm going to... God's just looking for somebody that believes it, cuts some timber and says, hey, I'm, I'm ready to get on down the road with this thing. And when God finds that, you work for somebody, you, you work for somebody. You ever think about starting your own business? No? You ever think about running something? Have you? Well, I like the way you're answering it. Why don't you listen to me? The scripture says, I will give thee power to get wealth. See, they don't believe that. They, they, they really don't believe that. We, we don't believe that stuff. So we think that we're supposed to, see, they think that this is just some prosperity message. I'm more in the Bible. I'm just as much in the Bible. If I was preaching Acts 238 right now, y'all be like, yeah, 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 yeah. If God said, I will give thee power to get wealth, 
You know what that means? Somewhere in you, there's a plan. Somewhere in you, God has a purpose. Somewhere in you, God says, I'm going to give you the power to do this and the ability and the mind to do this. I, I, I think I'm still in the book, and I know the charismatics have beat this thing to death, but I do still believe he said you're supposed to be the head and not the tail. Are y'all, are y'all okay out there? I'm, I'm wrapping it up. You believe that? Amen. Then go back and do something about it. Amen. I, intend to. I know you don't. Now listen. They're probably never going to invite me back after tonight. <laughs> but I'm going to give you my email address. And when it starts happening, I want you to let me know. You hear me? I'm, I'm dead serious with you right now. Look at me. Look at me. Is your pastor here? Is your pastor's here tonight? Who's his pastor? Oh. Boy. Where'd you say you were from? I'm from New Zealand. Oh, but you don't live there now. You're here. Oh. Listen to me. You. <laughs> Jet lag. You start praying on what you're supposed to give. When you get your check, you build an altar. Are you listening to me? Before you do anything else, you put it on that altar and you ask God. You direct my giving. I'm going to help you. He said part of that seed is going to be bread for you. It's bread to the eater, and it's also seed to the sower. Same thing. You listening to me? God intends for you to take money and take care of yourself. It's his plan. But he don't intend for you to make all of it into bread and eat it. Now, don't get mad at God because you didn't plant anything and it was time to harvest. You're out there saying, well, I don't know what's wrong. I, there ain't nothing coming up. Well, you ate it all. You ground it all up and made bread and you ate it all. You didn't plant one thing. Quit blaming God for your dilemma. Listen, I, I'm tearing this whole conference up right now. I'll give you all a refund, all right? No, I ain't either. Forget that. <laughs> Drive down the road one day telling God, God, I'm just so burnt. I mean, it's me. I'm just so burdened. I can't care. He said, well, that's funny. Why are you so burdened? My word says my burden is light. Now, if you're so burdened, that means you picked up something I didn't give you. And listen to me. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. But you listen to me. Well, you listen to me. I said, okay. Now, that's how simple it is. He said, I'm going to give you a plan. I want you to take what you're in debt and divide it by 100. And whatever that figure is, I want you to write a check. And when I tell you to give that in an offering, give it. So I did. I carried that check around for weeks. I was preaching for a friend of mine, and we were sitting out there having some fellowship, and the Holy Ghost said, this is good soil, plant the seed here. So I just took the check out and handed it to him. He said, what's that? I said, I feel to give you an offering. Man, he said, this is the first time I've ever had an, an evangelist give me an offering. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and the reason why I felt to do that is because if God blessed it a hundredfold, I don't believe that. Well, they stay in debt. And then here's the kicker. Do not go back in debt. I'm going to get you out. You stay out. Amen. If you really need something, pray about it. Amen. Now, you guys got to understand, salesmen love to see me come in because I'm an impulse buyer. I mean, they announced yesterday the new iPhone 5. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy one. I already got to figure it out. I'm getting one. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just like stuff, and I like my wife. It's, this is weird. I like to shop. She don't. And I mean, I can spend it. 
And I just walk in somewhere, and it's just really, you know, we'll just put it on the card. Hey, sign your name right here. We'll give you a new card. No interest for 90 days. Well, what they ain't telling you what's going to happen after 90 days. And so there I was. I could not do the will of God. I was struggling doing the will of God because I couldn't afford. I was so much in debt that I could literally not go do what God was asking me to do. And I was so burdened. I said, okay, God. He said, get out of it and stay out of it. I'm going to help you. These little miracles started happening. And when I got them, I'm ready to go buy something. The Holy Ghost said, no, 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 no. Pay this off. Pay this off. Then the next time a missionary comes through, you won't be sitting there snotting and crying. I just wish I had something to give. but I, It all changes. See, I'm preaching about a revival that's coming to your country. And some of you think this ain't got nothing to do with it, but what you don't see is this has everything to do with it. Because this is the people that God's going to pour his resources out on that's going to go out here and do something for his kingdom. I'm through. You believe that? Now, you start praying that stuff, and whatever God tells you to do, you do it. If he tells you he wants 30% of it, you do it. You married? Oh, well, you got it made then. You, you're getting off easy. <laughs> you hear me? Now, listen to me. And while you're at that altar doing what I'm asking you to do, the Holy Ghost is going to speak to you. And he's not just going to tell you what to give. He's also going to tell you what to start doing. And when he sees you doing this, he's going to start blessing. You hear me? Do you believe what I'm telling you right now? Will you do what I'm telling you to do right now? And it's done. Now, a year from now, I want to hear about what's going on. You may be like the other guy that the contracts come through on. You got people in your church right now that things have locked up on. Businesses and finances and stuff have locked up. And it's nothing but a spirit that's been sent and the Holy Ghost wants to break it. I take authority over every resisting spirit that's in this building right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you from this place right now in the name of the Lord. Let the gift of faith move into this place right now. Let the resources of God begin to flow into this place right now. I speak it in the name of Jesus. Let somebody, not just in an offering, but let somebody take a step of faith here tonight, God, and show you how serious they are in a miracle. They need their miracle, and they'll do whatever they've got to do to get their miracle right now. If you believe what I'm preaching, I want you to clap your hands right now.